Welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast, focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Join me as I interview the best and brightest Bitcoiners and people doing interesting things in Bitcoin. This is episode 49 with Marty Bent. Marty is the editor-in-chief of Marty's Bent, a daily email newsletter focused on Bitcoin. And he is also the host of Tales from the Crypt, one of the top Bitcoin podcasts. Here's my chat with Marty. Marty, welcome to the show. It's been a while and I've been wanting to get you on. Stefan, thanks for having me. Uh, very happy to be here. Appreciate the invite. Looking forward to this conversation very much. Yeah, look, I think to some extent, I think, you know, you've, you've made a lot of really good content in this space, obviously with Marty Spent, the newsletter, and obviously with Tales from the Crypt, both the interview series and the rabbit hole recap with Matt O'Dell, which is also a great weekly ongoing uh, uh, perspective on Bitcoin. Um, so, to some extent, it's a bit of a, you know, Bitcoin podcast worlds collide with this episode, um, but uh, I thought it'd be great to get you on and get your point of view on partly how you curate good material in this space, because it is like a fire hose, and you just, you just, you just have to try and find the good material and give that more of a focus in your material. So, maybe I'll throw it over to you there. Yeah, so... Um it's, it's a lot of data filtering, right? Uh, I am a Twitter freak. I've expounded upon this many times with Tales from the Crypt, but I've been uh, sort of fine-tuning this list of Bitcoin and quote-unquote crypto personalities and analysts over the last five years. I think I started the list in like 2013. Um, and I'm addicted to Twitter. So I'm on, I have my tweet deck up uh, at all times. And then, so Twitter for me is my, my sort of base from which I link out to outside sources. Uh, and the list that I've curated uh, has done a great job of providing great resources. So I think um, uh, for me personally, I've just uh, over the years, over the last five, six years almost shit, it's hard to believe it's been that long, uh, sort of fine tuning uh, the people I allow to feed me information on the space. And so for Marty's Ben in particular, a lot of the content I riff off of tweets that either uh, expound upon certain topics or link out to other good material on another website, whether it be Medium or some other blog or academic paper or something like that. Um, and, and it honestly is, like I said, uh, the tagline of the Ben, it's what I found uh, uh what I found interesting over the last 24 hours in the Bitcoin world. And if it's interesting and uh, it piques my interest and uh, I, I, I'd like to share it with the freaks out there. So um, always, yeah. And, and the other sort of mission of the Ben is to sort of uh, filter the signal through the noise. I know that's a very much repeated uh, phrase, especially in this, this quote unquote space. Um, but yeah, so I try to focus on things that maybe, uh, like I never try to write about price. I don't. I don't focus on price at all. I try to focus on the development and sort of the the de decentralized and uh, anarcho capitalist ethos that drives Bitcoin to sort of get people introduced to these ideas that uh, sort of uh, led to Bitcoin being created. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's that's a similar kind of approach in the way that I approach it as well. I mean, a lot of it comes from Twitter, um, but. I guess another aspect is sometimes there's good stuff that's not even on Twitter or good people who are not on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another interesting angle as well. Yeah. Um, that's a good point to make. So here in New York City, we have the BitDevs meetup and most of the people that go to that meetup probably aren't on Twitter. If they are, they're anonymous and lingers and not really contributors. And some of the best, uh, most dense information I, I receive about Bitcoin is at that, that meetup, uh, that technical meetup in particular. Um, the, the people that curate and run that do an incredible job. You know where you're going to get each time, but that's a very good point. Uh, some of these people aren't on Twitter. So outside of uh, Twitter as a resource, I do like to go to these meetups in person and speak to people working on the protocol, uh, have conversations with them, and, and see how they, they view the space and they're approaching Bitcoin. Um, and then beyond that, uh, yeah, there's this, the side, I mean, that's the, the other beautiful thing about Bitcoin. It's a very collaborative, uh, project. So there's a bunch of slide side channels, whether it be in Slack, Telegram, S Discord, Signal, name the messaging app. There's groups that you are either a part of or join. And a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information sharing in there as well. And then, uh, DMs and emails. Uh, so it can come from many sources. Twitter's my favorite, but it's definitely not the only one. 
Yeah, you're right. And I think the other way I see it is sometimes that person might not be on Twitter, but someone on Twitter might have linked to them, and then that might be how you find them. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, but sometimes there is a challenge there as well, like because you might find someone who has a really good perspective, but because if you're not a technical expert yourself, it may be difficult to understand how skilled they are on that particular topic as well. So. Yeah, and that's why I particularly like the BitDevs meet up here in New York. They have the the format of it is a Socratic forum, so it's a lot of people challenging ideas and openly discussing this in the open. It's not uh, it's not like a lecture format where somebody sits at the front of the room and tells you what's going on. It's very uh, it, the the uh, crowd is involved with the conversation and sort of driving it as well. Um, so it's good to see smart people sort of combat ideas in person. And over time, I definitely cannot contribute too much to the conversation, but I've been going for the last four or five years and just via osmosis, I sort of get uh, things I probably otherwise wouldn't have if I didn't go to these these meetups. Yeah, that's a great point as well. I think that's very, um, it's a great benefit of being in New York as well because uh, <laughs> the scene here in Sydney is, uh, let's just say there's a there's a fair bit of shit coining and blockchaining at some of the meetups here. So that's what I, I definitely use mostly online for my information. I met uh, one of your compatriots in Miami earlier this week, uh, and he was he was expounding upon the same thing that uh, a lot of shitcoiners in uh, Sydney. He was happy to be surrounded by Bitcoiners when he was in Miami. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely the case. I think the other thing as well is this space has really exploded, right? There are so many podcasts and other things going, but what is it that distinguishes the good podcasts uh, or the great, you know, the great podcasts? Uh, from kind of the general volume of crypto podcasts out there? I think focus. Um, that's what I try to do with Tales from the Crypt is focus on Bitcoin and try to bring on quality guests and, and be consistent and not get strayed away by uh, the allure of what I would consider to be uh, projects that may not be as worthwhile of Bitcoin, but are sort of easy to, to pick, quote unquote, like crypto celebrities or influencers to come expound upon something else. Um, and then... On top of that, I think I actually love the proliferation of podcasts in the Bitcoin space in particular because each one has their own flavor, each one has their own voice and a different way of sort of connecting with a different crowd. So Stefan Lavara's podcast may be uh, like really for a certain type of person, whereas Tales from the Crypt may be for another. And it's just important that you have different sort of voices reaching different types of demographics. And different. Yeah, that's a great angle as well. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, it is hard to find quality and there is so much content out there. So you do have to prioritize. So it is, um, it is, you do have to separate the weave from the chaff at at some point. Yeah, 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 definitely. And then what was, I think it'd be good to get your, what was your motivation behind starting the podcast and, and then also starting the rabbit hole recap? Yeah. So I think, I think we have to go back to Marty's band, the newsletter. So the newsletter started out of, it was May it was my birthday. Uh, I'm going to dox myself a little bit here. It was around my birthday and in 2017 and my parents were visiting Brooklyn and we were at dinner and uh, I was actually between jobs trying to become a product manager and uh, really didn't have anything to prove that I could do product management or had like product knowledge. So uh, the combination of that and the fact that I've been the Bitcoin guy and my family and friends group for the last five or six years and that was right at the beginning of the the price appreciation in 2017 in that crazy bull market. Um, so I had a bunch of texts and DMs and people reaching out like, hey, what do I do? What do I do? And I got overwhelming at a point. I was like, all right, I'm going to start this newsletter, number one, to prove I have a product knowledge of Bitcoin and try to explain it to people. And then number two, uh, help people learn about Bitcoin along the way. Um, and then it sort of took on a life of its own. And since then, it's been an iterative process of like, all right, people are liking the newsletter. Um but they want a little bit more. And, and it got to a point in the summer of 2018 um, where I was t- talking uh, with uh, a guy from Barstool Sports, Lewis Roberts, uh, meeting up. He was in the crypto and meet up and talk with him. And he was like, you should do a podcast. That's what people need. And I was like, huh, maybe I should. And so that's he sort of incepted that idea in my mind. And then uh, from there, uh, again, trying to provide quality guests and help people get an understanding of Bitcoin and the um, ethos behind it. And then Rabbit Hole Recap came to me because I had people DMing me like, hey, I want more content. I want like a, I think a weekly show would be great. And Matt, luckily, lives around the corner from me uh, here, in, here in Brooklyn. And 
we uh, we've met up many times outside of the podcast that recorded last year, and uh, I think we started it in September. So yeah, like this summer, I approached him as like, hey, people want to do a weekly show. I think we can do it in person every week if you're if you're down, and that's sort of how it started there. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I, I like that, and I think uh, this is a point I think many people have have touched on. But really, it's many people are often scratching their own itch. And, Mm -hmm. you know, personally for me, that was something that made me start the podcast as well, was just wanting wanting more Bitcoin-specific content and not kind of, oh, here's the next shitcoin of the week and here's blockchain of the week and whatever, Mm -hmm. a tokenizer of the week. (laughs) Right? No, and that's, yeah, and that's the, yeah, and that's the other thing. So so the first decade of Bitcoin and this shitcoin explosion that's coming its wake, uh, there's so much confusion and so much information to consume, so... I think with the newsletter and the podcast sort of getting very concise, you know what you're going to get when it, when you come to Marty's Bet and Tales from the Crypt. We're going to talk Bitcoin, Bitcoin specifically, and I think people really appreciate that focus again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's funny. It's funny uh, you, when you said the shitcoin explosion. It reminds me of uh, our, our good friend Bitstein. I think he came up with the term Scambrian explosion, mm-hmm. which I love. The Scambrian explosion. Bitstein's very good yeah. at memeing things into existence. Yeah, he is. He definitely is. Uh, okay, so then. That's kind of where we're at now. Do you have any thoughts in terms of the future of this kind of content? Is it going to professionalize? Uh, I, 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 you sent me these questions earlier this week, and I was looking at them. And I'm like, it's something I'm very curious to, to, to know as well. And I, I, I think so, because I think the, the disdain with the mainstream media in today's day and age is... Um, is getting to a point where it's allowing uh, grassroots, smaller content creators to sort of come up and, 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 like you said, scratch an itch. Like, I'm not getting the information I want in the mainstream, so I might as well produce it. And what I think uh, society in general, globally, people are waking up to is, holy shit, we have these tools at our hands where we can be the media if we want to. And uh, it's so I do think there, it's not like, not a scampering explosion, but there will be... Uh, podcast explosion or if it's not podcast something similar whatever it be smaller content creators sort of scratching that itch of i'm not being provided the information i would like to be uh, in the mainstream so i'll go provide it to the market because there's got to be somebody else like me and you can break that down beyond bitcoin any subject i saw somebody followed me today who does the number one new tropics podcast in the world and was like (laughs) (laughs) That's that's really like different worlds colliding, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's, I do I do think it uh, it is going to grow. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but uh, I don't think this trend is going to slow down at all. Yeah, right. And the other thing is, I think podcasting it like now to people like us who are kind of very much online, we see a lot of new podcasts and a lot of new things get started, and then someone at, you know like us might think, oh, well, how are people going to find time to listen to all these podcasts? But I think the reality is podcasting is actually still pretty early. It's massive in the US, but I think there's huge um, growth opportunity for the pretty much the rest of the world uh, to get into this sort of podcast material. And you're starting to see a lot more big companies even starting their own podcast uh, because they realize it's a good way for people to learn something because they might not be able to watch a full video, but they they might be cleaning or they might be on the bus or in the car or on the train, and they can just listen to a podcast, and they're happy to do that. I think that's a great uh, growth opportunity for podcasting. Yeah, when you're working out, like there's... like. The AirPods, what I'm what I have on right now, like the data's coming out that people are listening to more and more podcasts, audiobooks, whatever it may be, because of the the technology again. And one thing we probably should note too is uh, it, it's probably going to drive competition for better information, right? Like th- there could be a thousand Bitcoin podcasts, but that lights a fire under every one of those podcasters ass to provide a good quality product. You know? Yeah, that's a great point as well. Uh, it definitely will kind of skew towards the people who you know provide the most kind of good quality succinct information or people who are good at entertaining because i think that's another factor as well people who are just good entertainers will have mm-hmm. a good audience definitely so, yeah well okay so let's talk a little bit about bitcoins changing people so mm-hmm. i think that's a topic you obviously touch on as well and i think many of us believe that idea that bitcoin will change us more than we change bitcoin so maybe touch on that topic a little bit, Marty. Yeah, I mean, because Bitcoin 
uh, sort of diametrically opposed to the monetary system and the, uh, the uh, society driven by conspicuous consumption that we've grown up in, at least I have. And it's a complete aversion to that and sort of flips the table of how you view money and, and sort of your future. Uh, it's sort of putting cash in a savings account uh, up until 2008 uh wasn't really exciting for people. People weren't making that much money saving money, but now Bitcoin as a deflationary sort of sound money um, provides a savings vehicle where if you're, if you're frugal and, and low time preference and patient over time, your money could, could accrue in value and you can potentially buy more and, and uh, provide more in the future. And, but that's not to say that you won't consume in the present. You'll just think, uh, you'll just weigh the opportunity cost, and 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 at, for me personally, I uh, always had that question: Would I rather go out and spend a hundred fifty dollars at the bar tonight, or that's an insane amount? I've never said that much, but like, I'd rather go spend a hundred dollars at the bar tonight, or buy Bitcoin with that, and not be hungover tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it definitely changes changes the game in terms of our choices that we make, the food we consume, the the drinks we consume, mm-hmm. the purchasing decisions we make, uh, and then also how we save and how we invest for the future. Yeah, definitely. yeah. And like I had Yasin Elmander on from uh, from Ark Invest, and he was explaining how when he first moved to New York, he looked for the cheapest apartment he could find and he wound up like in south brooklyn and and red hook and was commuting an hour a day just so he could buy more bitcoin (laughs) (laughs) well it's i think it changes the game when you feel like you can you can properly save for something as well Mm -hmm. whereas in the past you might people might have felt a bit of despair that okay even if i put it in the bank account well it's i'm losing all this inflation money anyway yes i mean that's the podcast i just um published yesterday with bitcoin tina with richard uh bitcoin yeah great Rick. episode great thank episode you. thank you but that's sort of the driving topic of our conversation in that episode is is Bit or excuse me uh the current monetary system that we live under he described it as dishonest money we have a world of dishonest money and like you said with people sort of it leads people to despair because they they can't save for the future we're, we're at a point in america in particular where i think uh the, the stats are like 60 percent of Americans couldn't afford a four hundred dollar emergency if they needed to, and that's uh, that's a sort of fickle place for society to be on. Like it's sort of a society teetering on the edge of chaos, where people cannot uh, have the comfort of knowing that they can save for the future. It's a very important sort of comfort that we need as humans, I would argue, and uh, the ability to do that via Bitcoin, excuse me, via Bitcoin in the future uh, provides optimism. I would argue. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that that's a good topic as well to go on is just comparing sort of the the prior world or, you know, normally economics or what you might learn at, at university versus a more Bitcoin Austrian sort of view. So ha- in your view, what are some of the big differences or hurdles that a, norm- that a normal person trained in standard university courses has to overcome to really grasp bitcoin i mean i think the biggest hurdle is the university system and like because it at least here in the states and most most of the universities here in the states uh, preach the the uh the gospel of neoliberals and uh keynesianism and uh they really don't teach other schools of thought at least i i studied economics and really we didn't dive too much into Austrian theory or anything like that. It was strictly Keynesianism. Um, so you, the biggest hurdle is you, you, you're you sort of force-fed one particular viewpoint, one particular school of thought, and you have to go outside that system and seek out other schools of thought. And I just think uh, if you're not driven enough or if you think a lot of people will just be naive and like, hey, paying a lot of money for this education, it's probably right. Like if the these professors have gotten to this point and this university has gotten to this point what they're what they're teaching must be right so they probably don't even most i would argue don't even have the inclination to question whether or not what they're learning is is worthwhile or or the right school of thought yeah precisely and i think it then that drives certain behaviors in the rest of the finance world because that's where they learned a lot of these things and I think one example of that is just the colossal waste of time spent Fed watching. 
fed watching. That was my career for three years. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. And it, and it, it, it well, and that's the other thing. I don't, I don't understand how people can do it for more than three years and not be fed up. Pun intended. <laughs> So tell tell us a little bit more about Fed watching then. So what are some of the ways that you would spend time in the past when you were Fed watching versus now? Yeah, so my job I worked at a managed futures fund and and we traded futures markets obviously and currencies being involved in that and uh treasuries as well. Uh so my job I, I wrote our commentaries, our weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly commentaries. Uh so I was tasked with having to explain uh, why the markets moved against our fund position, or uh, why the markets moved, and why we were positioned uh, in certain ways within the fund. Um, and part of that job was uh, seeking out and waiting for uh, announcements from central banks around the world, uh, particularly the Fed. The Fed obviously has the most most clout in the world uh, at a central bank stage. Um, so it would be waiting for their their Wednesday minute announcements that would come out, and you'd literally analyze. It'd be the same script for the most part they would switch like four or five words and the markets would react like uh according uh, quote unquote accordingly based on the changing of that words and it's like a very vague almost mis- mystical uh control that the, these words that were coming out of the fed meetings had on the markets and it was like at time and time and as time went on for three years what you start to notice is that they, they'll set goals uh, forward-looking goals and they'll never hit them, and and then they'll they'll just they they do hedonic adjustments and stuff like that, and it's just there's no consistency of logic or, or there's no I would argue no connection to reality at the end of the day. Um, I I would argue we've gotten that far away from reality. Uh, you got to a point where people were looking at Janet Yellen's coat color to to see how she was thinking about the markets. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, if if it's red, that's, like, more aggressive and bullish. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> no, there was, like, quants in Connecticut who were writing algorithms, trading markets based off of information like, uh, like that. Yeah, that's insane. Uh, and I think it just, it, they, it focuses people's minds and it trains them towards the wrong thing, right? It trains them to try and sort of read the tea leaves of what our masters in the central bank and so on are doing rather than understanding what's actually going on in the real world. Yeah, and it, it, it's a... I've said this before, and it's hard to be vulgar, but it's like a piss on your face and tell you it's raining situation, especially with like the hedonic <laughs> adjustments and the adjustments of the CPI and the changing of the underlying variables of these metrics. It's all, it's all meant to sort of obscure the data so it looks like everything's peachy and rosy. But how can they honestly say there's been no inflation over the last two decades when you look at healthcare prices, education prices, housing prices, here in the States in particular? It's, it's asinine, in my op- opinion. Education prices, too. Like, to go to, go to school here in America, uh, in particular, like, the university system, it's way too expensive right now, and it's trickling down. Like, if the private schools here in America, too, this isn't really talked about it much much but um i was lucky enough to go to a private school on part scholarship uh in philly when i went it was like it started out at seven thousand dollars a year by the time i graduated it was twelve thousand dollars a year and now 10 years later it's twenty four thousand dollars at a high school it's ridiculous and they're going to say there's no inflation not just fucking hard and impossible to believe yeah it's ridiculous and i think what what's happened is this change of thought around what is inflation and also the con- continual adjustments of what the CPI is have led to just very nonsensical uh, outcomes in terms of like measure, you know, quote unquote measuring inflation and saying, oh, inflation this period was 2% or whatever. It mm-hmm. just, it's not uh, an accurate way to, it's not the lived experience that you and I, you know, actual individuals face. Yeah, exactly. Again, going back to that one stat, 60% of Americans cannot afford a $400 emergency fund or expense, excuse me. Like, how do they, like, is it, are they, they're not able to, people are not able to save. I'm at a loss for words right now, Stefan. I get jacked up about that. (laughs) Well, I think that stat also reminds me, because I've seen similar, some of those are in these, um, you know, these forums and subreddits around things like financial independence, right? So that's a bit of a movement now. And the, the whole thing around that is like you should, you know, you use all these personal finance concepts such that you save a high percentage of your income and therefore that will allow you to 
either be more financially independent or potentially retire early if that's your choice. And so in these forums, they often post those sort of statistics and say, look, you know, most people in this forum might be into saving a high percentage of their income, but that is not the general experience. No, not at all. I mean, most people are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I, don't, I don't even know. I would argue, yes, most people are living paycheck to paycheck. And it's a, it's a weird situation we find ourselves in, especially in the information age and the exponential pace at which technology is growing is, has driven the price of production down to such a point where uh, the economy is becoming very specialized as well um, if, you, if you want to make a lot of money. So there's, there's some tough conversations about how the pace of technology innovation is affecting our economy as well on top of uh, the shitty monetary policies we have as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the focus for me has often been what is the credit, the underlying money doing and changing our behavior, you know? So this might be considered the cultural consequences of fiat money, right? So here in Australia, there's actually an example of this company called Afterpay. And what this company, I think they are launching in the US as well. And essentially, they are kind of like a modern version of lay-by. So basically, they just extend credit to people who come in the store and they want to buy a, a dress or a shirt or whatever. And a lot of their market is often kind of like younger people who don't have a high income, but they really want to buy some clothes or a TV or whatever, and they'll use Afterpay. And so this Afterpay thing here in Australia has been growing like just massively. But there are potentially questions to be raised around what quality of credit this company has and is it just another thing waiting to blow up? Yeah, we have that here in the States called Layaway. I don't know how popular it is these days, but it's definitely around. But that is an interesting point. As like, it, it, How fast has that been growing? Oh, it's been going like 100% a year or something crazy, like even more than that, right? And so that is a yeah. change in our behavior. Or well, not my behavior, yeah, but many people, right? No, that, yeah, that's like a... It's like a low key indicator of hey maybe maybe things are getting getting out of hand if everybody's having to take a loan to buy sort of necessity goods or or what used to be uh, uh, attainable goods for most of the economy um and yeah and this is a an immaculation i i would argue and i believe you would argue as well of monetary policy tricking down into the the tendencies of people a lot of people don't like to admit this but when you have again going back to fed watching like the market's hung on every word the fed the Fed was pushing out on a quarterly basis. So you're only thinking about that next meeting. You're not thinking two, three years ahead. That's all you're waiting for is that next meeting. And then uh, that trickles down uh, as, as inflation takes over and starts robbing people's purchasing power over time. And they have to live paycheck to paycheck. They're forced to go out and buy stuff they need to survive. So, uh, and, and, and then uh, when everything's said and done, there's, there's not much left to either save or invest after that. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing with um, the whole Fed thing, and I think you were touching on this earlier, is around how they would say, oh, we're definitely going to raise the rates next quarter or in this time. But mm-hmm. And then it was really funny because you would see like, okay, sites so it's like Zero Hedge or whatever who would literally graph out when they said they were going to and then when they actually did or did not, rather. Um, and it, yeah, it, it looks like such the, a big the difference. Medusa chart, they call it. Yeah, yeah, they call it the Medusa chart because it, it's a bunch of projections they make, and they never hit it. So like the line just like squiggles up like next to each other. And it, 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 if you look at that chart, you say, how could these people have control over our monetary system? They're terrible at at planning it, and or or not even planning it. Or you're trying pr- to project the implications that the the pulling of the levers that they do will have on the overall economy. They're terrible <laughs> at predicting it. Yeah, exactly. And so I think. I think our buddy Parker Lewis actually did a great job of pointing this out in a paper. Unfortunately, it's private, uh, but he he wrote a paper called Ender's Game where he went back. So the Fed minutes, the full Fed minutes are released four years after the meeting. So out. So he went back to every Fed meeting from like 2005 to 2012 or 2013 and basically tried to point out inconsistencies of, of what Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen were saying at particular points of time and what happened in the future. And it's amazing how how little they they were expecting uh 2008 to affect the economy i think in march of 2007 there was like a, a mini housing it might have been march of 2007 or 2008 there was like a a five percent drop in the s p because it's a a tremor in the housing market and ben bernanke came out and said uh the effect of a housing market uh bear market right now would probably have like a 50 billion dollar effect on the 
on the economy. It turned out to be five trillion dollars. So it was off <laughs> by an order of magnitude. Uh, and and these are the people that have the keys to our money. And and I think people are starting to wake up to the to the fact that hey, money's pretty pretty fucking important. Uh, maybe we should we should start having discussions about about this. And and maybe central bank the central bank uh, system that we have right now is not is not most advantageous for us as a society yeah definitely and maybe you want to comment on you know those cases where they had to try and justify or rationalize why they didn't raise rates what sort of justifications did they offer it's like we haven't hit the target yet. yeah it was always their justification it's like we haven't hit the target uh in, um i can't think of anything specific off the top of my mind right now but it, it, it's i try to keep it simple stupid and yeah they they beat around the bush and simply they could, oh, we couldn't hit the target. We're not ready yet. Um, and it, it, really what they're looking at is the stock market and where that's going. I think that drives a lot of what their policy does. Yeah, um, yeah. But they won't admit that. Okay, how about uh, deflation? A very commonly misunderstood topic if you compare kind of people living and working or thinking in the mainstream economic way um, versus a more Austrian understanding. Yeah, I mean, deflation is the boogeyman of, of the Keynesian world. You can never have deflation. Um, but just, it, it, I think you have to approach it from uh, a human perspective uh, and a common sense perspective. Uh, deflation, in my opinion, uh, if your money is uh, increasing your purchasing power over time because you are, are willing to be low time preference and, and save save away some acorns, uh that makes sense. Like it, it makes sense that your, your hard work and your time should, should be, uh, should be rewarded. And in, in our current system, it, it, it it's not, like you said, we, we live in a society of conspicuous consumption. So, um, I guess the biggest knock on deflation is, is that people will not spend, uh, money in the future, in the present, uh, thinking that their money will appreciate value if they hold it. But that's just not true. People have needs. People have wants. people are going to spend their money, uh, these are just personal decisions. People have to eat, um, and uh, they're going to spend their Bitcoin or whatever sound currency to make that happen. And then, sure. And I think that is touching on the deflationary impact in terms of our future spending. And then the other commonly misunderstood one is the what we might call a conflation of two different concepts, which is one of them being, you know, a like bank credit deflation, right? Like the bubble popping, so to speak, mm -hmm. versus the beneficial deflation, which is like a growth deflation, like the price of things coming down over time. And people use yes. the same word deflation for those two concepts. Do you want to con con comment on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there is, you have to de it. Uh, and that's something uh, Richard and I were talking about yesterday too. You, you People are comparing the balance sheets of governments to the balance sheets of, of of individuals and that's just a wrong sort of conflation to make so if you have uh if you're an individual uh price deflation is incredible like you can buy things for cheaper uh that, that's what you want as a consumer right and um and then credit deflation is a whole whole different scenario where um it, it, it just can't be compared i don't i don't think and um i'm not an expert on all this too i studied economics i worked at a hedge fund for three years uh, since 2014, I've been sort of in the tech and design space, so I'm a little rusty on, on a few of these concepts. But uh, again, I think it's innate uh, that uh, like individual consumer good prices coming down should be a benefit, but uh, people would argue otherwise. What are, what are some other kind of common misunderstandings from you know, the normal world or mainstream kind of economic world versus uh, a more Bitcoin Austrian? Hmm. I've got another one. Uh, another one is uh, category errors, right? So I think a lot of, when you listen to a lot of the finance and investing professionals, they are often talking about saying, oh, look, Bitcoin doesn't have any cash flows. Why would I invest in it, right? Because they're <laughs> thinking of it like it should be a stock or a bond or something that yeah. has like a, you know, a return, a traditional return on it. Yeah. No, it's, uh, again, it's people not understanding uh what they're talking about and again it, category error is huge especially in the mainstream media covering this space bitcoin is is not uh is not a, a stock or an equity nor is it a startup or uh 
a v- VC fund investment. It is a monetary good, and this is a completely different animal than the other type of assets that people are trying to compare Bitcoin to, and it does lead to a lot of bad information out there. Um, so uh, trying to, uh, and that's a lot of what we're doing here, is trying to ed- educate the public on, hey, you need to view this from a different lens. And I think that's why Bitcoin maximalists get a lot of flack is because people have terrible category errors in this space. Money uh, money is likely, if it's sound money, is likely to be winner take all. And then on top of this is technology as well. So like protocol wars too, like it, it just makes sense for, for the world to call less on one or one or very few amount of protocols when it comes to money in particular. Yeah, right, right. And I think the other confusion that is often there is the reason why people hold money as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And well, and that's the other thing that uh, that's another category error because people don't, uh, this is what, another thing that Richard and I talked about yesterday, like the, the money that we have right now isn't truly money, it's credit and uh, holding real sound money is a completely different thing and you have completely different drives to do that. Um, so that's, again, that's another category error. So having to de- delineate between the credit money that we currently live under that's what the u.s dollar is it's credit and then bitcoin which is a bearer asset that you hold it's money it's yours you have the private key uh, that is not a debt that you own the future that's something you own right now yeah definitely cool and uh look so i think let's talk a little bit about where do we go from here like do you do you have any um you know speculation or thoughts on what uh how how long this kind of transitional period may take what it might look like or are you just kind of along for the ride no i'm beginning i'm beginning to think more and more it's going to happen faster than we realize uh this is something that i've really been thinking about and and it, it has to do with the pace of change is growing at such a rate that we can't even comprehend as humans like our, our reptile brains like chemically cannot comprehend how quickly things are changing and i think that uh leads us to to make to have some blind spots in our trajectories of how this will play out so i'm beginning more and more to tend to believe that this will happen faster than than people expect um so people say this may take 30 40 years i would cut that in half maybe like 10 15 20 at the at the most i think and that's just uh just looking at the rate, like the iPhone came out 10 years ago, look where it is now. Um, the internet is only, I mean, the internet with uh, with browsers is what, 20, almost 30 years, um, and look where it is now. And Bitcoin, what's going on with Lightning, looking at the exponential growth of the Lightning Network and the innovation going there, it seems like we're almost at a tipping point where there's going to be like a, uh, an explosion of innovation and, and building that that we sort of can't see right now, but it seems to be starting pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. And uh, what are you kind of most interested or excited about over the next few years from a Bitcoin point of view in terms of like technology or um, kind of social trends? Uh, yeah, so Schnorr, obviously, Schnorr Signatures is a big uh, uh, big want of most Bitcoiners to to help. Uh, make the, the chain more efficient and more data efficient in particular. So I think the conversation around that and how we may soft fork that into the protocol is is going to be exciting. Uh, and if it ever if it does get implemented, it'll be very exciting. And then obviously Lightning, uh, continue to see people be reckless and experiment with that and sort of uh, create new ways of, of monetizing content or products on the web or whatever. Things are going to be really exciting with that. Um, and then uh, with Peter Woola and Greg Maxwell just announced a few weeks ago at Mini Sketch. Yeah, like, I, that's so bandwidth. People would argue that uh, that uh, the uh, state data of the blockchain is the most important thing, but really it's bandwidth. And that, so I'm excited to see innovations like Mini Sketch that'll make bandwidth uh, considerably uh, more efficient, which which in the long term um, is 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 good for decentralization. So those are the type of upgrades I'm looking forward to. Fantastic. And let's comment now a little bit on the social or cultural aspects. So which kind of groups in society do you think will be the next big kind of waves of people to come and come into Bitcoin? So, what, you know, one example might be this whole Patreon thing of, you know, encouraging a whole new round of people to get into Bitcoin so they can pay Bitcoin lightning to their favorite content creator. 
Yeah, definitely that demographic. They're they're awakening to the fact of Bitcoin is free speech money. So there's many ways to to pitch Bitcoin and the narratives around Bitcoin. So that one that's been picking up is free speech money and people that have been deplatformed and sort of shunned from the traditional uh, financial and technological infrastructure. Sort of realizing, hey, we need we need this. Um, so that's definitely one demographic. Uh, unfortunately, despotic uh, despotic <laughs> governments as well. Yeah. Um, they're probably going to get in They're They're definitely a demographic. So if you looked at the coin metrics, um, coin metrics did a breakdown of mining pool coin based data over time. And what that pointed out is, is more recently the, the number of unknown mining pools has been growing pretty significantly has been making a comeback. So a lot of people are speculating, maybe those are, are countries who are, who may be mining Bitcoin and don't want to disclose that they are, uh, just the, theory hypoth- or th- just a theory but it, it's a possibility um and then one that's not talked about as much but probably should be talked about more is young people like really young kids like uh, uh, like, like generation z and kids being born today like the thought of going and opening up a bank account is going to be asinine to them in a future where bitcoin exists and i think uh they innately get technology even better than i was born in the 90s and i grew up with the internet but Again, going back to the pace of change, it's so quick, and the younger generations probably have an advantage at uh, adopting and, and getting this type of technology more innately. Yeah, I think I was going to say that's a big um, growth vector, let's say, the children, right? Um, I think there was some mm-hmm. good discussion on Twitter recently about that. I think the guy's name was uh, Eric Wall or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a good thread on that. Yeah. Um, also, another thing that might be interesting for you to comment, Marty, is... Uh, Free speech money, and it's a branding thing. Free speech money versus sound money. Yeah, I'm I'm for both. I mean, it, it can. It, that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It, it, it's uh, what is it the uh, the meme of people with blindfolds touching an elephant and thinking it's many different things. Um, but Bitcoin is sort of that Swiss Army knife, where it, depending on what your background is, whether you're a libertarian or a sound money libertarian or a free speech a- advocate, and it could be pitched to you a certain way. So free speech money like bitcoin is hypothetically uh censorship resistant you can download the software contribute check it uh and nobody can stop you from doing that and being able to receive and send payments without having to go through a third party that sort of checks whether you're you're uh a palatable individual to do to to conduct commerce in the world that uh that sort of that sort of doesn't exist in bitcoin so you have uh, and again other people people would argue that money is a form of speech so you are uh you are spending your your money uh to sort of represent your voice so uh the free speech uh aspect is definitely a very important aspect to drill into people it's like hey you can participate in this nobody can stop you and then sound money uh is just another way like hey this censorship resistant money protocol just happens to be the soundest money on earth on top of it so you're going to be saving your purchasing power throughout time as well yeah it's just an added benefit yeah exactly i think you make a good point that the message will obviously change to appeal to slightly different groups of people and i think obviously all the libertarian types they all already know about bitcoin whereas uh, a lot of the free speech advocate types they might know of bitcoin but they don't really understand bitcoin yet or they might not have done much reading into it or they might not have done many bitcoin transactions yeah exactly and um and that's that's the beauty like uh uh, and satoshi knew this as well and satoshi said in the beginning this will probably appeal to the libertarian crowd first we should probably uh introduce it to them and sort of use that as a trojan horse to to get some get some value and and some attention around bitcoin Uh, libertarians were as a sound money advocates were obviously uh a number one demographic to sort of target to, to help pitch bitcoin and satoshi knew that and and recognize that early on. Look, I think they're probably some most of the key topics I was looking to hit. Um, but I suppose uh, just maybe as a final comment, Marty, if you could offer uh, the listeners just some advice on ways to get information about Bitcoin and where to kind of best learn about Bitcoin, uh, maybe that would be a good uh, place to finish. I mean, it, it would be remiss of me to not tell people to go to Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, uh, nakamotoinstitute.org start with their crash course um, to understand if you want to understand Bitcoin from an economic perspective. I think there's a wealth of information on that. I think it's important to go back 
and read uh, the complete Satoshi in particular in, in the early uh, email list conversations that were going on, the early Bitcoin talk forum conversations that were going on, because you will find that there are a lot of arguments uh, that are popping up again today that have happened uh, many times throughout the last decade. And a lot of FUD that is in the news today has been has been debunked years ago. And, and a lot of these conversations are, are, are recycled. So uh, to avoid uh to avoid um, attention loss, trying to discern wh- wh- what uh, what is right and wrong about this FUD, I would go back and sort of read these arguments from from the early Bitcoiners where they've already been hashed out. Um, and then uh, on top of that, Twitter. Obviously, you can go find my my Twitter list. I think that's a great source. It's going to you know, be be warned. You uh, be warned. There are shit coiners on the list. <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to see what they're saying and just see how everybody's pitching everything. Um, and I think it is important to know, and there are things to be learned by by seeing other points of views as well. So, I am uh, a, a Bitcoin maximalist who's more open minded than some, but that's okay. Whatever, uh, whatever flows people's boat. And then, don't be afraid to reach out. I mean, there are a lot of again, this is a collaborative sort of project, and uh, people are more than willing to to answer questions. That's sort of when you realize that you, that you, if you're not shy and you and you ask questions to people that you think may be able to answer them, a lot of them are willing to answer. Um, and don't get disconcerted if they don't answer. Just maybe ping them again, uh, and then maybe try to find a Bitcoin meetup and, and and meet like-minded people and hash out these ideas. And um, another thing I would recommend is starting groups. Like if you have a bunch of people that are trying to get into Bitcoin at the same time as you, um, learn together. I mean, find a buddy and 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 work through this stuff together. I think that's uh, that's also very helpful and, and helped me out uh, in the early days as well. Yeah, fantastic. I think um, that's a great way to finish because I think over time, obviously, we're getting newer and newer Bitcoiners and they may not be kind of aware of the history and the um, the relevance of various you know articles and things in the past. No, it's important. There's a ton of information out there. Um, so finding the quality uh, information is is a struggle and it is, it is a process. So uh, don't get discouraged. It's uh, sort of create a a process of, of how you discern uh, what is good and bad information to you and, and sort of stick to it and start filtering and filtering and filtering and you'll eventually create a, a data source that's it's feeding you quality information. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, I think that's um, pretty much it. Um, but obviously, you've got to tell the listeners, those of you who are not already subscribed, where can they find Marty's Bent and your podcast? You can go to martysbent.com. Uh, that's the sign up. Uh, subscription list. Uh, I post it on Twitter. I'm actually working on a site to congregate all my uh, content as well. Uh, there will be more on that in the coming months. Uh, that's a process. And then uh, Twitter, I'm at Marty Bent, and uh, Tales from the Crypt is at TFTC21 on Twitter. Go give it a follow. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. That's where I'm mostly hanging out. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Marty. Thank you for having me on, Stefan. It's been a pleasure. Hope you enjoyed the discussion with Marty. Remember, if you like the podcast, make sure you retweet and share it with your friends. Show notes are on my website, stefanlevera.com. That's it from me. Speak to you guys next week.